upon which all speculation is impossible, beyond the reach of thought. She quotes the Mandukya Upanishad in the beginning there. Beyond the reach of thought. Well, we keep wanting to reach. It's a good exercise, but it's beyond the reach of thought regardless. We need something else? Yes. It doesn't say, she doesn't say it's beyond the reach of using Buddhist language in the voice of the silence, prajna. It's not beyond the reach of what would be called gnosis. Gnosis or prajna, direct knowledge, direct experience. Anyway, um, Threads of Zen in Theosophy, or Threads of Theosophy in Zen, or Threads of, the of Zen Theosophy in Us, maybe is best, huh? What is that about? I'm going to condense this as I go. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, at Point Loma, Boris Dzerkov uh, made contact with D.T. Suzuki through a Zen teacher in Los Angeles named Nyogen Senzaki, who was a Zen uh, Roshi. He called himself the uh, Mushroom Roshi, though, not for eating them, no, but for, because he never had a place. He was always moving from place to place to place to place. And through him, Bo uh, Boris contacted D.T. Suzuki, and Suzuki on his trip, I think it's 1936, he's coming to the West and going to England and he stops at Point Loma for a day, and Dzerkov is showing him around Point Loma. And Suzuki, of course, was familiar with Theosophy through his wife, who was a member of the Adyar Society, and they had founded a lodge earlier in Japan that lasted for a short time, which was covered in uh, Shinichi Yoshinaga's paper briefly. So, but Suzuki had read The Voice of the Silence, and he had appreciated Blavatsky, and Boris recounts that he stopped in front of the picture of Blavatsky and said, she is one who had truly attained. And then uh, another little anecdote, my father also remembers Suzuki sitting, uh, eating, he brought chopsticks with him, he was eating, or maybe they provided some, I don't know, he was eating with everyone. And still in those days, as in Catherine Tingley's time, the Theosophists ate in silence. It wasn't like people were always, you know, Point Loma was pretty, uh, kind of m almost like a, a Buddhist monastery. It was pretty, not a lot of chit-chat talking or discussion of uh, things going on. People were doing their activities, engaging in things. Quite unique in that respect. In that respect. Uh, later, um, K.G. Nishitani, uh, who knew Suzuki well and also written a number of books on Buddhist philosophy, says of Suzuki, he showed that Zen is not just Buddhism, but the consummation of all religion. To show this universality of Zen, he took up the mystical religious experience and often made special reference to the affinity between Zen and Western mysticism. Of course, for us gathered here, we could rewrite this uh, and you know, transpose the word Zen for theosophy and make a similar statement. But I thought it was interesting that Nishitani is basically saying, you know, appreciating the universality of Suzuki. That's what really his mission was about. E.S. Stevenson, uh, again referred to in uh, Professor Yoshinaga's paper, who was the Point Loma Theosophist living in Japan, uh, quotes Soyen Shaku, that was the first Zen teacher to come to the U.S. to the Parliament of Religions. He, Son Shaku, points out that Zen is not limited to Buddhism by any means. Stevenson quotes him, Zen is heart, he says, for in the heart the answer to all the great problems must be found. And now, given our earlier talk, uh, in this respect, absolutely not referring to physical heart. This is the Japanese Chinese word shin, which comes from the word fridaya in Sanskrit relating to the absolute essence of things, more related to the idea of prajna, or uh, direct knowledge. 
theosophy would say, the, the Buddhic principle. A few points from Catherine Tingley and Point Loma. We could compare, in principle, the lifestyle and activities at Point Loma during Catherine Tingley's time from 1898 to 1929. And to do this in depth, however, is outside the scope of this presentation. I would only say in brief that the Point Loma practice of daily silence, being mindfully present in all activities with equanimity, whether of study, gardening, exercise, music, or art, had most certainly a great deal in common in terms of lifestyle and modality with Buddhist monastic culture. Tingley's theosophical culture had, of course, drawn the creative elements from Greek and Western traditions of art, music, and drama, and universal global traditions of the perennial wisdom. E.S. Stevenson, the Point Loma theosophist who taught and lived in Japan, gives his understanding of some Zen theosophical Raja Yoga Point Loma instruction. Stevenson says, the object of Zen is not to instruct by verbal teachings, but to arouse the internal perception and power of concentration of the student. Like Raja Yoga, the aim is to give a balance of the faculties and enable one to find the truth within. It's from an article he wrote for The Theosophical Path in 1913. It is evident in her talks and direct teaching style that Tingley definitely exhibited many elements similar to Chan and Zen teachers. There are many unusual anecdotes demonstrating her intuitive, Zen-like, spontaneous abilities when interacting with students there. There are many examples, especially uh, when they were doing dramatic productions at Point Loma, which was frequent from both uh, Shakespearean and Greek tragedies, this was when Tingley had the most interaction directly with students of all ages there. So everyone was participating. It was a whole community event. Everything from you know, making costumes to uh, music compositions, everything, the whole choreography of everything, the whole production. And she was very much in the middle of this. And while on one point of view, it could be seen that Point Loma was a rather orderly and clearly uh, scheduled kind of place. Uh, Tingley herself would say, and referring to herself in, as, a, as a teacher of, uh, or in, you know, someone who e invoked and evoked uh, new qualities out of her students or from her students, she would say, I work best in total chaos. It's really a significant part of Tingley. And sometimes she overstretched in some areas that way, perhaps. But uh, so this chaotic, creative, energies that would happen during the dramas is where she would engage this way. And she would often just spontaneously, something would just be thrown on somebody, either a change of part, for example. I think, uh, I don't remember how many weeks, but someone became ill and my father had to learn the part of Prospero in Midsummer Night's Dream. I think he had three weeks. Yeah. Or another example is Elsie Benjamin who considered herself quite uh, with, with zero uh, artistic potential, perhaps, uh, quite bluntly, uh, was suddenly had a, several yards of, of uh, cloth handed to her by Catherine Tingley and had the person next to her, uh, Catherine Tingley, pointing to the person and say, yes, make, you know, dress them in their uh, toga gown. Uh, Elsie was quite horrified, <laughs> and uh, I think it's recorded somewhere, this, you've heard it, I think, yeah. Anyway, but it came out perfectly, much to her amazement. She can't figure out, even, even 50 years later, she wasn't quite sure how she did it. There were I mean, many examples of those kind with Catherine Tingley. In the moment, seizing moments to expand one's character and development, perhaps. Frequently in her talks and things, she always was used language. Uh, for example, uh, now is the t is the moment of now is the time of attainment, not some, not I mean as, as profound as meditation it is. Not the future manvantara. Now, this was Catherine Tingley's uh, emphasis. 
In her meeting in Darjeeling with a Tibetan she describes as Blavatsky's teacher, this is 1897, and she says this is a young Tibetan. She recounts what he conveyed to her in that meeting. The trouble with some theosophical aspirants is that they waste the strength of their lives looking at the goal ahead rather than at the immediate moments and seconds of which the path is composed. And so their better selves become exhausted. They should let the beaming thought pour itself into each arriving moment and be indifferent to the morrow. One can find in every instant of time the door into worlds of golden opportunity, the gateway to a glorious path stretching out into the limitless eternal. When people say they are seeking happiness, they mean that they are aiming at that stage in their evolution where their present problems will be solved. To reach it, one must withdraw from the allurements of life and all its outward and discouraging aspects and find himself in the solitude of his own being in a silence unbreakable within his own heart and mind. Concentration is a power inherent in the self and above and beyond the mind. It cannot be found in the objective world, for it is not there. Men's possibilities are in direct proportion to their ability to see beyond themselves and to feel for others. Many of our aspirants begin with the letter and go backwards in search of the spirit, but let them hold to these things in the silence and create a noble future in their hearts, going alone into the morning, into the silence of nature, freeing themselves there from their old trying memories and from all anticipations of trouble, let them make themselves at one with that light in nature. Again, there's no direct connection to Zen here, but these are principles found both in Zen and in Catherine Tingley's uh, Raja Yoga school and how she often expressed theosophy. As she said, it was her job to make theosophy intensely practical. Where are slides? Next. Oh, we have, yeah, this is it, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard, there is an answer to your question. All right. The horrible boundless word is there, yes. In this case, in what, uh, from Jita Peruker, he has a little article called The Three Stages of Visioning Truth. So he will use the word that, tut, from... Indian tradition, in part of that, and the first part is from Zen tradition. So that, that same as boundless, same as the fundamental proposition of the secret doctrine, speaking generally. Next slide. So de Prucker, in a short talk entitled Three Stages of Visioning Truth, which was later published in Wind of the Spirit, he gives this outline. The opening of the heart may be divided into three stages. We are familiar with these in that form of Buddhism which originated in China, coming from India. In Japan, it is known as the Zen form of thought. Three stages. First, there are the mountains and the waters. We're all our mundane world, our daily world. It's very simple, but extremely, perhaps difficult, what we're going to do here in the next couple of minutes. So I'll go a little slowly. So GDP says, the opening of the heart may be divided into three stages. Yeah. In the first phase, the mountains and the waters of the earth are mountains and waters. Mountains and waters meaning tables and chairs, mountains and waters, all phenomena. The phenomena are phenomena. We've all had parts of, you know, during the day, there are times when we just, we experience everything just as it is simply what it is. We aren't, yeah? 
This relates also, this is part of the homework, but I don't know who remember, if you remember to bring your story that Ryan talked about from yesterday. This is, we have the same, same teaching here, same. So, first there are the mountains and the waters. We see them as, uh, recognized as GDP says, as worthy of study, research, and their wonder is seen and sensed. But as he says, they are only phenomena. They are only mountains and waters. Second, then as we begin to develop, GDP says, we begin to see that the mountains and waters are experienced as illusory. Phenomena are the result of hidden causes, noumena. The world is unreal. Phenomena from hidden noumena. So uh, our, our mind gets going and our uh, analysis gets going and our psychological experience gets going and the impermanence of things comes to us. Things are moving along and we see, oh, I, can, I get it now. It's, uh, this is a little, it's quite different. You know, and we get kind of settled into that place and we think this is it. Yeah, I'm here, it's illusory, da da da, it's like that, right? Everyone think of examples in your life where you see through things suddenly and, and all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, that's the way it is, sure. Now I understand. Hmm. Next one. So then GDP says third stage. The mountains and waters are paradoxically at the same time both real and unreal. So I'm not going to say anything for a minute. Except Peruker says, happy is the person who understands this. Why does he say that? The third step of psychological opening, this is to Peruker speaking, the third step of psychological opening, and in this third step, he realizes the wonderful paradox of all that he knew before in the two earlier states. In this third step, he learns that inwards and upwards, the mountains, after all, are real, and the waters are, after all, real, in a certain wondrous sense. For illusory though they may be to our relatively imperfectly evolved human understanding, nevertheless, it is fundamental reality which has produced them forth. This is back to the question, understanding infinite, boundless, in relationship to our s seeming separateness from that. But are we separate from that? Is there any, it's not possible. So then we see at one and the same time that the only reality is the divine, and yet that this divine, because it is the utterly real, makes real in a certain sense even the illusory appearance of cosmic phenomena. Does the story end come to mind from yesterday? Yeah? In applying this to ourselves, we sense that the only real part of man is the divine within him, and yet precisely because this divine is reality, that very physical phenomena which we call the physical man is in a certain sense real also. We have come back, the circle has re-entered itself, we come back to the point of starting. So, it's an unusual perspective GDP is giving here because this is about process, this is a, about a psychological opening, you could say. Uh, and we go through this process frequently during our, the day, our day in life, I would say. Frequently this is happening, but sometimes we're not so aware of it. So, he's emphasizing to become aware of this. Any, any comments or questions? There's this, uh, everyone's getting very quiet before lunch here, I'm not sure. Is everyone's blood sugar crashed? Or is, there, uh, or is the, has the boundless uh, silenced our brain mind? Uh, 
uh, question is, what is the relationship between Taoism, uh, Zen, and Buddhism in esoteric uh, terms with this theosophy work? Oh, very good question. After we get through this part, if there's time, I'll get to that. Yeah, this is the... I skipped to the last third of my talk to start with first here, so... Yeah. yeah. When I look at uh, the three stages of uh, uh, developing understanding, um, maybe you could compare the first stage with a materialistic view on life, the second with an absolute idealism, and uh, the third one with objective idealism, where uh, compassion plays a big role. Could you uh, say something on that? No, I think that's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll say something in a minute. I want to see if there are any other comments first. Anyone? Huh? So GDP continues mm, to what I would call, he's taking it then, really we could have had one, two, three, and then that coming forth, not really forth, it's there from the beginning. So it's this kind of non-dualistic perspective. He says the key to these three stages, and he gives the following kind of a poetic expression. He says he has taken from Dhyani or Chan Buddhism. I'm, I don't not know, he doesn't say where he got it from, unfortunately. He also says that he did not get it from D.T. Suzuki, so there could have been other sources, of course. There were many opportunities for other sources uh, in his own studies and with people visiting Point Loma and all. So he says this is a rather, it's a poem, you know. In the wind of the mountains and the sun of the lowlands, in the fall of the night and the mists of dawn, it is cried aloud that alone was, is, abides. He goes on, the whole universe is that and all its phenomena are productions of divine causes, noumena, or divine thought, so that all are essentially unified in a divine oneness. In a rather pragmatic way, we can bring down this thought and say that all men are brothers and that everyone is his brother's keeper. You see the path of conduct. There is a way to peace and happiness and wisdom and power for once a man realizes he is one with nature and nature is one with him, his consciousness becomes vibratorily speaking one, co-rhythmic with the pulsings of the cosmic heart. For the universe and we are one, there is but one life and this life is also cosmic thought. So, I think it you could say that one way to look at that third phase is, is what you said about objective idealism. Though in truth here, Peruka is speaking very experientially, which is a little challenging, to, not just conceptually. As he says in, I think, volume one somewhere, discipleship or chaleship, as we say in theosophy, is a, a matter of being not of talking about being. But we still get to talk about it, so. I mean, in the third phase, talking is also an activity of that. But it's, uh, as in the story from the other night, bringing these points together, does that make sense? This is a little difficult. We spend a really a whole workshop on this, actually, and talk about nothing else for at least a morning. John. I think the first principle should, uh, should be modified. No, oh, there we are. I think perhaps we should modify the first fundamental principle and say that it is that upon which only speculation is possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah.
Any other thoughts? Anything? Anyone want to comment or stretch their imagination from the Kenneth Morris story that Ryan shared last night to this? Ken? Yeah. Yeah, here I am. Um, I also see an um, analogy with the story of Plato's cave. Right. Where you see uh, shadows first and then recognize there is a something behind the shadows and then you see that there um, there is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, makes the shadows and um, again a force behind it but when you get out of the cave the, the, the same situation happens again you, they see the images in the water and then they see the things themselves and then they see that there is also light uh, coming uh, and making things visible. Um, and I thought, is there a way, um, uh, uh, it looks as if you have to go through these stages uh, in every cycle. Do you understand what I mean? So is there a way to, to um, uh, maybe it's, it's well, well, maybe that's a false parallel, but uh, like we also may be need a Wilson, maybe we need to go to see phenomena first. I don't know if, yeah. Can you follow me? <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, I think definitely the correlation with Plato's cave is absolutely there. I think the only thing is that there, the third step in the context of that uh, goes another step that is not exactly in Plato, I don't think. Perhaps in the Neoplatonists later. Uh, and regarding Wilson, the only comment I had uh, is that uh, it's quite optimistic to think that we are picking up and putting down Wilson's with uh, this extraordinary sense of uh, being aware of, the, of Wilson. My only thought is that we need to discover all the hidden Wilson's inside of us that we've been carrying along for uh, lifetimes and uh, let them float away might be yeah. Yeah. that we all carry many 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 Wilsons quite unconscious generally Ken, on the same moment you are in condition number three you realize that you need a vessel but you don't keep the vessel for real yes that the vessel in the paradox of three is that the uh, is where the content and the or the the, the the perceiver and what is perceived uh, and the content are one. For me, is it uh, similar like using a body? We need a body, but the body is not real. That is yeah, not me. That would be in two. That's where we see the vehicle as something unreal. Hidden causes, phenomena, all phenomena, not just body, any rupa. So the Heart Sutra, the core of Mahayana Buddhism is saying form, rupa, not just meaning physical body, all rupa, everything we're perceiving through our senses. And what do we see not, perceive not through a sense of, uh, or perceive through a sense of self and other? Subject and object, we say in Buddhism. All those is rupa, form. Through all the senses, five senses, maybe there's a new sense coming, but still, even if we dream, imagine, it's all through the five senses. That's form. But Buddhism says form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. Not just form is emptiness. Then it would be full, full circle. Form is emptiness. First, form is form, form is emptiness, form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. This is the Heart Sutra, basis of Mahayana Buddhism, or the logical system of Nagarjuna. That's a bit much to say all at once, I think. But Question, Phyllis? You know what this reminds me of, too? It reminds me of Yana Yoga, mm. where something in the vessel, yours or another, uh, sets off a resonance. The resonance becomes the second, which is 
there's something behind the vessel that's being adduced, and the third is that you begin to live in the real and the unreal is the real. Right. And that is, but that's something we do, I think, all the time. We just are not aware of it. Yes, I think that's correct. And I think the key here it could be elaborated more in the, in what I read from Peruker is when this essential oneness is experienced, it means that ethics and compassion is intrinsic in the universe. It's not, while we have to uh, educate ourselves slowly, ultimately it's intrinsic, it's absolutely there, the very nature of reality. It's not something we have to learn, it's something we have to simply rediscover in the source of ourselves. And it's very difficult to uh, come to the third stage, but we thought we had a help uh, in our study group. Uh, the vessel as such, the Wilson ball as such, uh, isn't very real, it's only a form. But the ball and the vessel are built from building blocks, living consciousnesses. And uh, I said it more often, if you see your hand not as a form, but as a whole family of many millions of living uh, consciousnesses, of living beings, then you look at every form you can see and uh, discover the living beings uh, uh, making that form. So I don't see a table, I see a million of living uh, atoms, and they are my friends, and they are my co-brothers, and the form, uh, tomorrow I hope, this organization destroys those tables and buys new ones. You know, uh, the form is not important. In the third stage, you see life everywhere. And the form is uh, there, but not uh, the life. The, the life is important. And if you look at your environment in that way, you can see through forms, through political parties, through nations, through even humanity, and you see life uh, behind it, and that gives a kind of liberation, I think. Yeah, I think the uh, really each each level has its appropriateness, and then there is, the, as Phyllis was saying, there's the dynamic that these are. It's a it's a process movement that's happening all the time. Sometimes we're more aware of it, sometimes we're less aware of it. How's our time? Quarter past one. Hmm. Maybe, yeah. maybe I have also an, an addition. Um, yeah. uh, Erwin talked about the Plato's cave, and you can see that as a uh, process of evolution. And when you come out of the cave, uh, there's also a process of uh, a growing evolution, but Plato, uh, if I remember well, says that uh, in the end you uh, are able to see that behind everything you have the idea of the good that he calls in his uh, state uh, the, the highest idea. And I have also uh, I don't know if you agree with that, that you can compare the idea of the good with the word that uh, uh, in uh, Buddhism. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think we will close. That's the last third of my paper. The other part we'll save for another time. Uh, I think this, this was the more important part, though, so in terms of our actual... Uh, experience. Oh, and I didn't answer your question yet. Yeah. Just a thought on this is that there was a, uh, I read once, I am that I am. And I always ask, what does that mean in that sentence, the word that? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> and <laughs> so I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't go along and just say it, you know. 
that was the idea, so I, I didn't understand it. So being a Lutheran, I said, well, I won't say it, but it's interesting that you all say, say that. And the thought that came to mind from Buddhism is the effortless striving from the heart to contact something greater or subtler than you are to have a deeper experience would be to make no effort but strive, or some of these sayings start to come to light about reaching the unboundless, which is the God indwelling, calling us to come to God at, bound to this ego form or something, where the crux of the matter is the ego to go from the unbound to the bound, but we have to get through this stuff of life, which imparts the lesson to learn as we take it real and pragmatic and meaningful, not to change it, but to somehow unbound or something. These thoughts that are come from different readings um, about that, is there any commentary from the uh, philosophy but, readings about that? Uh, absolutely none. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, a very good book is uh, called I Am That by an a Indian uh, kind of eccentric uh, iconoclastic guru uh, of some years ago now uh, by Nisargadatta Maharaj. I Am That. Quite good, really, theosophical. I think it's really re good to remember that that expression, I am that I am, is really ehyeh asher ehyeh, which means I am that which I am. Right. Yeah, the original Hebrew, yeah? Yeah. Lunchtime? The other part's too long to start, so yeah. I will save it. Okay. We like to restart on uh, 2 o'clock. Oh, have a good lunch.